to meet you all. Mm -hmm. Putting back to full screen. Yes, uh, I'm the CEO of Boreal Bioproducts, a Finland-based early phase startup in the in the forest economy. Uh, personally, my background is uh, I'm a physicist originally from Aalto University here in, in Finland, but more of or less have done all of my career in, in business-related activities, development type of uh, activities, but also related to to fibers in in, in previous. Mm. We are saving the world from the fossils, like so many, of course, when, when involved with the renewables and, and biopolymers. Um, we are predominantly working with industrial side streams coming from the forest sawmilling. So if you think that um, how much, for example, could there be this kind of a side streams that we use in a sawmill it, it's quite a lot there's more than 15 million tons of them in, in europe alone or more maybe concretely if, if you think that you put a log inside to a sawmill up to 20 percent of that goes into side streams in sawdust and bark and so forth so there's quite a lot of material to to work with and and that's that's what we we do we are integrating to part of the the forest value chain so we have partners, industrial investors and partners in the in the forest industry, and we are using their side streams. Predominantly, we are talking about sawdust from, from softwood, but can be other, other types of feedstocks as well. And uh, what we have is a basically a water concept, water as a solvent biorefinery approach, pressurized hot water, physical, mechanical, separation and fractionation. So basically we are using centrifuging, so gravitation, uh, membranes, evaporation, these kind of technologies to then isolate what we get out from the from the biomass. So that's that's what we do. And and what's the kind of a beauty here is is that wood as such is a very good and these kind of side streams material since it's side stream first of all, state of the art use would be incineration more or less, burning it. Uh, it's available 360 days a year, more or less the same kind of a homogenic quality and, and as such. So it, it really makes a good kind of a feedstock to be to be working on in, in this. So this is this is what we do, a water-based biorefinery. And this is how we try to differentiate in the in the genre of, of biorefineries as well. They are more chemically oriented approaches and and, and, and so forth. But this is our, our angle to it. And then, of course, as an example for CMPC here, which is a company from Chile that would kind of prove and bring the scalability in, in future to other regions and, and geographies as, as well. So why we are also a part of EPNO is that our main product is, is a polysaccharide. So if, if uh, fractionating the hemicellulose is a way that in, in water that would be the, the main component. But we do also capture parts of interesting lignins that are native to the wood and, and not sulfonated or, or soda, soda type of, of lignins. And as we are working with the kind of a semi-transparent membranes and, and such, we fractionate also lower molecular weight uh, C5 sugars and, and, and phenols at the, at the same time. And then, then we do get an interesting, nice lignocellulosic fiber biomass as, as a kind of a side product from our, our process. But would be me then moving more into other raw materials, let's say bark, then we would have a tannin rich compounds as, as our products. So this is, these are our products and, and this is the core of our thing. But the thing is that these are mostly new and novel ingredients to the, the markets, and, and we need to be finding the uses for, for those ones as, as well. So uh, that's that's what we are then doing together with industry partnerships, but also universities like Chunlin here, representing Opa Academy. We are in a few projects together with, with them on national and also EU, EU level up approaches in developing developing uh, products, but also directly with other, other companies and partly also with our own, own uh, organization. As a kind of a young company, most of the things is, is still in, in the pipeline, so to say, it's, it's being developed. But uh, for example, uh, left 
top side here, hair care, we have an, a product out in the market for consumers where our sugars are used as, as part of a shampooing uh, hair care product series and the kind of a role and, and function of a, of a surfactant basically in the, in the formulation there. And then of course, looking other applications to prove the market to, to make the kind of a transition to, to using green, sustainable, renewable materials. materials. Since we are about polysaccharides, I wanted to go a little bit more deeper also that what is our sugar or poly polysaccharides are predominantly galactoglucomannan, so mannan type of a polysaccharide since we're mostly uh, working with, with soft wood and, and spruce. Um, certain type of functionalities that it carries and what you can as is leverage in, in product development that it has and, and those kind of enable something to be used as a barrier, to be used as a cosmetic ingredient. But of course, then we have ongoing development for further modifying the, the polysaccharides. It, it's kind of a crude of, of, of the bio in, in the sense that it, it, it goes for many, many things. So some of these development activities include, uh, of course, color is something that you always want to optimize with bio-based materials, so bleaching approaches, but also how these kind of uh, maybe low molecular, a bit uh, shorter uh, and, and weaker, weaker fibers or, or chains uh, would work in, in different applications. So how to improve, for example, the mechanical strength through cross-linking approaches and, and softeners or uh, how to improve the reactivity towards the other other ingredients in, in the matrices through crafting and, and synthesis or, or just by uh, fractionating different molecular weights uh, to kind of have more specific or more purified products at, at the same time. So this this is mostly kind of on the development side done on the need that comes from the market purposes, not so much. On, on the research side, but partly also also there in those kind of approaches. Um, having a raw material that is a side stream coming from a biological origin and using only basically bioenergy as, as the input makes the sustainability and especially the climate impact quite small. Uh, Basically, in comparison to any fossil-based ingredients, uh, there's a substantial re reduction in, in, in CO2. And that's, of course, kind of a door opener for, for many things. And then also the fact that we are standing on the shoulders of existing sustainable forest management. Also, when working only in this approach that we are, we are, we are doing, we can claim that we have completely natural products to start with, then of course, further modifying and chemical processes can, can be applied. Basic products are completely natural from this point of view as, as well. Some of you might think that this is a kind of a Nordic or Finland-based based approach, but actually there's quite a lot of um, forest-based industries in many other European countries as well. Austria is big, all the kind of uh, Adriatic countries in Southwestern, uh, Southeastern Europe have a lot of a lot of activities, and even even Portugal has like a close to two percent of the GDP in in uh, forest related businesses. So there is scalability within Europe, not limited to the kind of Scandinavian approach either. Where we are at the moment, uh, our story starts actually already in two thousand and eighteen when the company was set up. And it stayed for some years, a laboratory, uh, interesting, interesting level. Things were happening, but not, not really picking up uh, very, very quickly. And, and then, like many startups, they need money at some point, And there was eagerness to get financed and, and, and uh, develop. And, and finally, uh, an industrial financer from the forest industry was, was found in, in 2021. They invested in the company and enabled to uh, scaling from labor laboratory out to make a 
small scale production, what we call pilot plant. That that's really kind of also shaped the direction what we are doing currently as as well, looking into cosmetic applications, looking into also then bigger industrial applications that could bring volume versus the more cosmetic maybe value as well towards the future larger plant plant implementation. And now we are on a plan and a timeline towards making a first industrially sized production plant in 2026 type, which kind of has parallel tracks on many ways. There's the financing side of, of things, uh, raising money, money related to that, the technical side, making sure that the technology that works in pilot scale does work also then when you scale a thousand times bigger so that the small problems do, do not scale up to big problems, kind of. So that's that's one of the reasons of having a pilot plant and uh, this kind of a stage gate uh, approach going, going forward. Uh, but also then trying to demonstrate in, in larger scale that, yes, we can produce and, and, and make. So this is more of the techno-economical side of, side of things. And there we are in, in good, good speed. But then there is the business commercial side as, as well, that these new applications, developed applications need to have enough market pool and, and commercial ag agreements. And this is, of course, the trigger for the investments in the, in the end as well, that our future customers will uh, tell our investors in the end of the day that, yes, we will buy these materials at the certain volumes and certain prices, and, and that will trigger off then, then uh, scaling up to a, to a factory. And of course, there are kind of a colors of, of uh, or shades of, of gray in, in this as well. We don't need to start immediately from the huge scale. You can build something smaller first, and but think it modular, modularity and build the kind of a concept in a way that you can scale then from something smaller to larger within the same facilities, within the same same processes as, as well. So this this is our plan then going for, forward. And uh, since this session was especially about entrepreneurship, I wanted to maybe move into that that side as as well so this is now so far nice and and uh kind of a, uh, how, how we are going to proceed in a, in a smooth way but the, uh, personally i'm not actually the founder of the company but uh, I, I do consider myself as an entrepreneur and i had to make a choice at some point that should i become an entrepreneur should i become the ceo for the for the company and uh, just before googling the, the googling before the session kind of a reasons why to become an entrepreneur i find a quite nice list of of, of different kind of alternatives and, and for myself i would pick few from this list uh kind of a passion yes but independence and autonomy coming from a corporate background working in a large stock listed company, you don't necessarily have the kind of independence and autonomy always, but you wanted. And this was really something that triggered at least my motivation to have something of my own in, in, in that, that sense. Uh, there are many others, but certainly what's on the bottom kind of the list, the legacy building actually is something that was a motivator for, for myself. Uh, to leave kind of a, something tangible behind that is standing on something sustainable, something that you can believe in yourself as, as well. So I would maybe raise myself these two from, from this very good good list. And if, if there is someone who's watching the, the recording or from the audience, kind of a, these are the kind of things that you need to think when when there is kind of an opportunity or if there is an opportunity that what what really kind of ticks my motivation to to become an, an entrepreneur and and what what would make the difference and well then if that decision has been 
made um, if we now go more in the context of, of what we are doing renewable chemistry basically uh, kind of a pros cons drivers of, of, of the whole, whole setup uh, it's kind of a easy to be in this kind of a business I mean the values that we stand on they are honest you can really really build on, on something like this there is a huge need for making the green transition through making renewable products in the market and it's it's really a door opener for most of the discussions and it's it's easy to get get when being with materials physical materials chemicals biopolymers they're tangible you can touch them you can measure them uh, you can really also see the, the impacts in, in in real that that helps uh to kind of make things true we can calculate the CO2 impacts or or kind of a how much in material we can replace and, and, and this this for. Uh, in general, the regulation is pushing also these kind of businesses to be developed. So we do get kind of a good certain support from that angle. It's always a kind of a two-sided thing. You, you shouldn't be maybe establishing businesses only because of, of regulation, because it, it can also change from that that side. But in general, the, the overall tendency is so so big, and it's it's a driver, and there is a lot of existing still existing financing for for these kind of uh, initiatives and, and approaches. The challenges then when going into renewable chemistry, it's 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 complexity as you probably have faced here so many times. I'm sorry, it's not not. Not a monochemical, a single chemical, but it's always like how oh, polysaccharide wouldn't be a single GGM molecule, but you would have small amounts of C5 there, and you would have small amounts of lignins and their complexes and, and so forth. So it, it gets complicated quite quickly. And then your customer, customer's customer is not familiar with that, or or you have to start finding ways to educate them and, and so forth. Uh, on the other hand, we are living still in a world that's been for 100 plus years since oil, oil has been drilled and products being developed, been developed for tens and hundreds of years based on phosphate ingredients, synthetic chemicals and their specifications, their performances and their prices as well. And this doesn't definitely make, make it easy for, first of all, new type of approaches to reach the parity in the cost levels, to reach the parity in, in the performance, to reach the parity in, in, in these kind of angles. So you're facing kind of a long history of, of development at the same time. And you might face challenges with the value changes. Is there availability of, of uh, raw materials or does the product work exactly in the same way? If it doesn't, the value chain would need to invest into change somehow to a new machine for making a coating or to a new machine making packaging or some, something. And these tend to be uh, slow processes in the, in the value changes as, as well. And then as in all maybe chemistry related, we are talking of machines, heavy assets, steel, which is expensive. And usually you're with large volumes and lower end of the margins as, as well. It's not an easy return on investment to be financed basically but the good sides definitely definitely uh, beat the, the kind of a challenges here mm. don't want to dwell too much here on, on entrepreneurship why startups fail because we are not here to to fail but what i also wanted to raise from here that it's not only about the external side of things but it's also about team it's also about the organization it's also about the skills in the top 10 regions of why startups in general fail it's about not having the, the right team and sometimes the reasons are also beyond your kind of control there is just the wrong time the moon and the stars are not in the right place at the at the at the moment or Regulation is just at the moment in a way that uh, doesn't make it make it uh, uh, possible to get get to market fast enough way for for example. But the team is one one uh, important thing that comes here in what I also wanted to kind of a list 
things that what, what are on our table and for now as a company as, a, as an entrepreneur what am i work, working with and and I, I guess this applies to any research innovation in the sense that you have a finding product x that works for y uh, whatever it is uh, new coating material or uh, innovation in, in uh, quantum mechanics and, and, and so forth but that needs to be taken into a real life and, and, and the juggling starts it starts always with the product of course more or less uh, does the kind of innovation itself function in real what what does it mean in real does it work when you scale it thousand times bigger does it work in a real life application where you put it into a matrix of other materials or an application of a let's say a fiber or or a, or other plastic type of a material uh, is it compatible with other chemicals so if if working with uh, medicines or or cosmetics it's not enough to to bring efficacy but you need to be compatible with the rest of the 65 ingredients in the in the product as, as well and in the end functionality counts do you outbeat the existing benchmarks in the market or are you actually just a me too product reaching the kind of a same thing same same but di different so what is your angle and what is your value to the to the market as, as, as well and then you start working and you have kind of a proof of a concept from this kind of a product on the other side of, of things okay we need people to to do this and so uh, how do we attract people as a young startup maybe it might not be easy to to attract all of the people who are the founders do they have all the same set of skills needed for for taking things forward so you do you actually need to make your first recruitments or do you actually need to make many recruitments since you are a growth phase scale up scale up already so uh, there's quite a lot of lot of to think from the entrepreneurship and it really kind of a concretizes usually to one or two persons being the, the CEO or head or some, something who, who kind of a, has this pile of things on their table at the, at the same time. Uh, scaling technology, mm, when, when in this biochemical domain, uh, usually you need to establish a process of, of your own. You, sometimes you can, of course, try it and find ways to to use other ones production facilities and assets and then have a strategy to to make in, in make or buy in buying the service and, and production but quite often you need to make sure that the technology itself is scaling up it works in big and it's cheap after all unless your markets are small and very expensive in medicines or something something like like this and then is the whole customer and, and market side as well. It starts from asking that where do I find the customers and who are they? And and when, when you have kind of identified that, how, how do I get in touch with them and, and, and so forth? Uh, how do I position my products against the existing offering? How do I price them? Uh, when you get forward with, with some of them, they will start asking you that, okay, this is good, uh, but we want exclusivity. You don't work with anyone else. Are you okay with that? Is the volume enough? Does it enable your business? And and, and so forth. So there's quite a lot to take care of on that, that side as, as well. And then uh, suddenly you are in a position that you need to be developing a production. Even if a small one, you need to be able to balance your development activity and production. You can and not usually do the same thing at the same time as, as well. And shipping goods, well, how do I pack them? What kind of a logos do I print them? Who is actually doing this? And, and, and so, so forth. And then maybe building the process at the same time and, and ensuring that the production capabilities and capabilities, the quality stay at the, at the same level. So these, these kind of things come to you in addition then there is the financing and pitching side of thing and this is what you always see then from startups they're making these grand pitches for five minutes but that's just top of the iceberg in, in the sense all of these other things are kind of going there in, in, in behind but even in the financing side it's really important to to know that who are you attracting who are you pitching to it's not all the investors that would be interested of your 
case and your, your business. So you need to understand that they have their investment strategy and their owners uh, this kind of a business or this kind of a, uh, investment strategy to, to invest into you as, as, as well. So raising few things when making the leap of faith and, and deciding that what motivates me and why I want to become an entrepreneurship and then what will be next next on your table in, in this sense. And then, of course, we are changing in the end also the pot of coal. But like you saw maybe in the list of, of reasons, the financial independency or, or reward is, is there, but it's usually not kind of a driving force. Or I don't believe that it can really be the driving force alone. It's, it's really the other aspects that makes the entrepreneurship so much more interesting and rewarding to you at the, at the same time. Uh, closing the loop a little bit back to the organization, those topics that you saw on the, on the previous slide as well. This is how we tried to build the, our organization as, as well. Of course, it's quite heavy on the development side, on the product and, and application uh, development side, but we have clearly set roles for the technology development, for the operations development, market-related activities, and then, then also, of course, there are all the other general finance uh, and, and such activities. And But there, even though there's quite a many lines on my, under my face here, it, it doesn't mean that I'm alone there. Of course, we can use service providers, we have an, a board of advisors who can be supporting us as, as well. At the moment, we are uh, eight people in the in the company doing the development. It's not a lot for being a bio uh, industry uh, kind of a approach, but these are of course full time people, so not all the partial uh, service providers have been have been list, listed here. And and of course, we are growing as well more in the application side. Uh, towards the implementation of the future plans like in the, the operations and technology design and then of course sales and general and administrative activities as, as well and just maybe to introduce the rest of the team uh, you know me now already then we have designed the organization in a way that we have the polymer and polysaccharide chemistry with, with Anne-Sophie we have certain expertise in, in cosmetics through our really lot of uh, with the industry R&D career in, in director positions in cosmetics development. Then we have polymer sciences and lignin sciences represented by Tony and Alexander as well. And then long long track recording in scaling of technologies with Bertie and Asim and uh, also experience from the bio-based markets through the forest industries and composite industries with Antti. So always been kind of a design to meet those skill sets and and needs that were depicted on the, on the previous pages as, as well. So that was my 25-ish minutes or 30 minutes something into from side streams to main streams and a little bit to how it's to be an entrepreneur in this kind of biochemical. So thank you for for your time and attention and now open for any any discussion and questions.